Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. It's important to build a trusting relationship between you and your doctor, especially if you have a chronic condition that causes you to see him or her often. So what happens when your doctor decides to retire? It's happening more and more frequently as all of us grow older. In fact, it's one of the major reasons for an impending doctor shortage in this country, and Hampton Roads will be impacted too. Up next on Another View on Health, a panel of experts along with my co-host, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby, on what must happen to keep the doctor pipeline open. But first, yep, it's that time of year. Time to join the Another View family for the first time. Come back to us if you've been gone a while, or even up your sustainer amount if you can. It's our fall membership drive, and joining me to talk about it is Another View producer Lisa Godley and daytime voice of WHRV-FM, Dr. Dr. Barry Graham, as in not medical, but as in education. <laughs> as, right? as in PhD, that's right. <laughs> I'm on, that's why I'm on this side of the glass today and not in there. 1 800 940 7170. That's the number to call to make your pledge of support. We will not ask you for money or anything if you want to call into the show, but we do want you to pledge to continue to support the show. So this is a different number 800 800- Nine four zero seven one seven zero, or go to whro.org and make your pledge of support there. Lisa and Barry, why? Well, because <laughs> you know we bring you something that you just don't get anywhere else, and we're we're excited to do that. But if you support what you love, you'll make sure that it continues. And we want that to happen. We have a match today, too, Barbara, a $2,000 match, which means yes. <laughs> as if you're pledging, you're you're doubling your money. So, hey. That's a good thing. Now is the time to make that call, 1-800-940-7170. Absolutely. Uh, join the family of uh, public radio listeners who, who believe in the power of public radio. And I want you to, to think just for a moment, where would you be without public radio in your life? Where would you be without the ability to tune into this wonderful conversation that I can tell you people work so diligently and hard on week in and week out through the course of the year? If you have appreciated this program and so so many people tell me in the community how much they enjoy and appreciate this show. If you're one of those, then make that contribution. Thank you, Barry. You know, it was interesting. I was at a community event last night and a lady came up to me and she said, I thought you retired. And oh. I said, oh, oh, wrong okay. Barbara. <laughs> Just the opposite. I said, no, actually, I'm still on the radio. We're still here. Absolutely. 1-800-940-7170. If you appreciate another view, and I will tell you, you really don't hear the conversations that we have on this show anywhere else. And we take great pride in that. Um, we just entered our 14th year on the radio. Yes, yes, yes. 14 years we've been here. And with your support, we can make it another 14 more. I don't know if I'll be here that long because I'm getting older, but <laughs> but we'll see. Um, Lisa, I know that you get great pleasure in planning the shows every every week. Yes, I do. I do. I do. And I, and I really enjoy taking the show out into the community. So... If you have, you know, an event, I'm getting a look. If you have an event, because it's a lot of work to take shows out into the community, yes, but I is. love it because we love being able to meet you and interact with you. So if there's something coming up, you know, just let us know. Reach out to us and let us know, and and we'll see if we can work that out if with our schedules. But it's just, it's just. I, I, it brings me so much pleasure to be such a part of this show and and to put to help put another view on the air each and every week. It's just. You know, it's really important because people think that, um, oh, well, because you're NPR, you get funding from NPR or you get funding from the federal government or you get we depend on local support for our local shows. And that's why it is so important that you become a member. And, you know, we have this thing, the sustainer thing that we do, where basically you tell us an amount of money that you'd like taken from your credit card or your checking account on a monthly basis. And then you can just sign up and 
you can just let it run for as long as you want. You can cancel when you want. We don't want you to do that. But you have complete control. But you don't have to worry about, okay, did I sign up last pledge? Is it time for me to renew? No, let's, you know, become a sustainer. I'm a sustainer. Um, The majority of staff are uh, sustainers. And actually, our guests in the studio today are also sustainers. So... Uh, if you want to join us and make that happen, give us a call right now, 800-940-7170. Or, Barry, where else can they go to make that pledge? They can go to whrv.org. They also can use the WHRO app. There's a little red button right there on the app, and it takes you just about 89.5 seconds of your time, <laughs> and you have done something <laughs> terrific for your community. You've done really something terrific for yourself. You've invested in public radio and another view. Absolutely. Lisa, the last 30 seconds. That's yours. Okay. I'm just asking you, telling you, support what you love. This is your opportunity. I run into so many people out in the community, and they say, and I ask them if they're a member when they tell me how much they love whatever they're listening to. And a lot of times I get, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. This is your opportunity to do that. (laughs) Do it. Make it happen. 1-800-940-7170. Stay tuned. Another view is coming up. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you for your pledge of support, those of you who have already done so. And if you haven't yet, you can call us during this hour. Your gift to Another View and WHRV-FM will be matched dollar for dollar up to $2,000 if you call between now and 1 o'clock. So give us a call at one 800 940 7170 and make your pledge today. And thank you. According to the Association of American Medical Colleges, America will face a shortage of around 150,000 doctors in 2025. That's only four months from now. Now, what does that mean for our area? Here to talk about it is retired neurologist, Dr. Armstead Williams. Hi, Armstead. How are you? Nice to be here. Nice to have you. Thank you. CPA and president of Bruce Holbrook. Holbrook Consulting, which specializes in financial consulting on healthcare organizations and physician practices. Mr. Bruce Holbrook. Hi, Bruce. How Uh, are you? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you for being here. Joining us by phone is renowned radiologist, biomedical engineer, and former director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Elias Zerhoni. Dr. Zerhoni, how are you? I'm great. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for being with us. And of course, our favorite cardiologist and co-host of Another View on Health, Dr. Keith Newby. Hello, Keith. Oh, you know something? I'll tell you, one of the things I love so much, coming in here, that introduction, I mean, what can I say? Thank you. I always feel like a, like I should be on a pedestal when I come in here. Thank you very much. I tell you, tell, talk to my wife, please. <laughs> I'll have to get back here a call and talk, talk to her about that. So, you know... It, it actually took us two months yes. to pull this show together, yes, didn't it? Yes. Because we, because the schedules and trying to get these very busy doctors and, and professionals um, to be able to come together to talk about this. But Keith, I know this is a passion of yours, so yeah. I'm going to turn it over to you and let you lead the conversation. Well, well thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, we're talking today about this aspect of shortage of doctors. And it's important because it, even when you look at who's taking care of us, and, and you know, I was make a comment, my older brother's a physician and he and I were talking the other day and I said, man, I think we're in trouble. I said, because it's trying to find, get a doctor's appointment is like pulling teeth, you know, and trying to get into, even as a physician, trying to get to another physician is an act of Congress sometimes, not because of anything other than accessibility, Mm -hmm. you know, who, how many people we have and who's serving the purpose anymore because people are retiring and we don't see as many coming in as we have going out. And that's an issue, so we have to talk about it. So, having said that, <laughs> let's talk about it. Why, why is there a doctor shortage? Why is there a doctor shortage, Dr. Armstead Williams, who just retired? <laughs> <laughs> I worked another 10 years before I did. <laughs> there, there are more of us. We're getting older, some of us. Um, we have a large military presence here. We had a good thing happen in 2019, was Medicaid eligibility expanded. 
Virginia finally, after five years, said yeah. we will expand Medicaid. Before that, if you were, if you were single, it would, no matter how poor you were, you couldn't get Medicaid insurance. Mm. And and if you're a family making more than about ninety seven hundred dollars a year, you couldn't get health insurance. You couldn't get Medicaid. So Obamacare expanded that in about two thousand fourteen. Virginia took five years dawdling before Ralph Northam, the governor, got this through. Um, and but that brought in a whole influx. Twenty five thousand more people with insurance who didn't have insurance before. So and those twenty five thousand people now all of a sudden need a doctor. And they and had unmet problems. They had things that weren't being taken care of. A lot of them. Mm-hmm. Doctor Zahoni, from a national perspective, <laughs> what is that the same facing the same issues? Yes, it is. Uh, this is not a new <clears throat> discovery. You know, uh, <laughs> when I was the NIH director twenty years ago, all the projections were showing that we will hit a shortage of great magnitude about by now and growing actually, getting worse between now and 2034. That's why actually WMC, the medical colleges, worked on increasing the number of physicians trained, and they did by about 20%, mm-hmm. and, but it's not enough. And then when you talk about shortages, there are different pockets of shortages. Primary care is probably the, the topic here because patients now have more chronic diseases. They need primary care more than specialty care, but our system is Funny, because you pay more for specialty care than for what you really need, which is primary care. Mm. And, you know, people follow the money. And doctors have a lot of debt at the end of med school, and they will choose more uh, financially rewarding specialties, which are not the primary care specialties, especially when you talk about the Medicaid, Medicare population. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so the other thing with that, too, is, you know, not just I'm not a primary care physician, but I have family that are primary care physicians and having done that before I went to a specialty. The demands that are placed on primary care are growing, you know, and I think about the number. And I tell you, doctors, we're allergic to forms. <laughs> I mean, I, I tell you, I mean, it's just I get somebody hand me some form and I'm like, look at this form. Like, I don't want to fill out this form because it's detailed. They ask for things that uh, you have to go digging back into old records to find. And you will find that when you're like have to see 30 plus people a day and then on top of that, you have phone calls to make and test results to review. To you know, people to see in the hospital, which most of us still, you know, now there are some that just spend time in the office in the hospital, but uh, as a cardiologist, I have to do both. And then somebody gives you a form that takes you an hour to fill out sometimes, wow. you know, depending on the detail of that form. So when you think about it, as a primary care physician, they have all these responsibilities and people don't really understand that piece. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like people say, I don't want to go into that, you know, because I have to do X, Y, and Z. It's not just taking care of patients like Back in the good old days, so to speak, you have a lot of other responsibilities that people don't understand. Prescription mm-hmm. refills. And even though the EMR systems were supposed to make things easier, to a large degree, I think it's made it more complex. EMR? EMR, which is Electronic Medical Record cool. Systems. My apologies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that has made it a little bit more challenging, even though by definition you would think it should be easier. But, you know, a lot of EMR systems or medical record systems don't talk to each other. You have oh. – so there's a lot of you know, propriety with that. So if they don't talk to each other all the time, where they, a lot of times they don't, mm-hmm. then you run into this issue of trying to find where people's records are. You have your own, but if somebody goes into a hospital, you have to have that hospital's EMR system. If you don't have that, you know, then you have to try to find it, you know. So that means you may have to call the hospital. I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's a never ending battle. Yeah, that, that so keeps going. yeah. So when you look at the aspect of getting people to go into medicine, the toughest part and it's multifaceted. It's not just the workload, but it's mm-hmm. the uh, obligations. I love what I do, and I think most doctors do. So you, you put in the time, you put in the effort because it's in your, you know, this is your passion and what you want to do. But when you think about the cost, I mean, because I, I think if you look across the board, the one, uh, you know, never ending, you know, similarity between everybody that goes through medicine is what does it cost me to get educated? You know, and you think about that. I was part. just getting ready to bring Bruce into the conversation yeah, yeah, about that. Because- yeah, yeah, interesting conversation. And I was mentioning, uh, I walk around again neighborhood in the moorings and I ran into this one woman one one morning and she was uh, 
I, she had her uh, scrubs on. I asked her, what was she a physician or was she a nurse? And she said, well, I'm kind of a physician. And she, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I'm a re- third-year resident over at uh, Children's Hospital. And I said, well, I'm working on this project with Dr. Williams. And if, if you don't mind ask me, let me asking you a personal question about your finances. You know, we, we need it for our research. And she said, go ahead. And I mm-hmm. said, how much student debt do you have? And, you know, you would think maybe 200000 300000 she had a half a million dollars of student debt. Whew. Half a million dollars, and she was in pediatrics, which is a low-paying uh, specialty or, or area of medicine. And how do you recover? How do you ever make enough money to pay that off? I and mean, just How do you make enough money to pay that <laughs> well, off? Well, you switch your, maybe go back. You go and, back and switch, and switch <laughs> your residency? You become a cardiologist. <laughs> 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 but anyway. Even that's a lot of money yeah. so for a cardiologist. So number one is that it that issue has to be addressed. And the one thing that uh, <clears throat> Dr. Newby didn't bring up, which I think is important too, is that the new physicians are coming out. It takes 1.5 new physicians to replace one physician like Dr. Williams. And that's because Explain, yeah. Why? because of the changes in lifestyle, things like <laughs> yeah. that. The, the new ones, I mean, first thing is I'm not being uh, – sexist or anything but there's a lot of women that mm-hmm. are coming into the profession and a lot of you know men and now lifestyle says hey you know i want to have a family after practicing for two or three years and they get out of medicine or they may work part-time maybe two days a week and here mm. you're taking a person that's gone to medical school taking a slot and are they going to, where we you know we're in a crisis situation right now and they come out and they're only working two or three days a week and then then the others don't want to work as hard. I mean, Dr. Williams and I know Keith, they're good friends. I, you call him up at 8 o'clock in the night. Well, he's retired now, but you could, I still call him up because that's how I get my free care. <laughs> but, 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 yeah, they, they used to work those hours. Yeah. And then you come home and you kiss your kids goodnight and see them maybe in the weekends if you weren't on call. Wow. Yeah. 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 Work, work-life mm-hmm. balance. Absolutely. Yeah. That's Bruce, yeah. Bruce, did you give him free accounting too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he did give no. me free accounting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I had to work an additional 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, in Old Dominion, 2012, figured that we are going to be 1,000 doctors short by next year. That's mm. 2012. 2012. Okay. So, mm-hmm. And they figured the medical school would, the other medical school graduates, about Thirty-five that was the with state with state with state. So still, that was we were leaving more than about six hundred doctors short. That was before COVID, before Medicaid expansion, before things happened in the military, before doctors didn't want to work the crazy hours that we always worked. Wow. Um, it, so we so yeah so that whatever estimates they had, you have to kind of double triple those. So if a young person is thinking about. Um, and Dr. Zahoni, I'm going to come to you first on this one. If a young person is thinking about getting into the medical field, um, you know, you guys are painting a, a very, you know, <laughs> good picture in terms of, of this as a career. What else would you say to them to make them want to to go through it, even though these are some of the challenges? Yeah, I mean, I have a daughter who decided to become a surgeon. And I always asked her, how did you make that decision? And she said, there's something noble about being a doctor and and directly caring for patients. Keith was saying that. Uh The problem are the obstacles we're putting in front of them. I mean, Keith is completely correct. The practice of medicine has changed. It's no longer a patient-doctor relationship. It's a doctor, insurance, administration, bureaucracy. Then the patient comes. And mm. I did this when I was at Hopkins. I was the head of the clinical practice for three years. And I tell you, I asked people to review the charts from the 1970s. And then I was then, uh, this was 1996. Mm-hmm. I said, let's review a chart today. And how many people need to be in touch with a patient in 1970 to care for that patient? And how many people are necessary today? Let me tell you what it was. It was three Three full-time equivalent were needed for an encounter in 70. The doctor, a nurse, and a, uh, a maybe the uh, the assistant, okay? Mm-hmm. 19 people were needed in 1996, and I guarantee you now it's 25 yeah. because of all the insurance and all the pre-authorization. The doctor has to call a nurse in, uh, in the insurance company to get approval for doing something. And when you looked at the amount of time spent in 1970 talking to patients, out of one hour, it was about 45 
to 15 minutes. Today, it's 27 minutes maximum. So you've spent 33 minutes of your time doing that. So the issue is not so much what do you tell a, mm. if, if a young physician, because there are people who really want to do what medicine is all about. It's the oldest uh, you know, profession that really uh, satisfies the, uh, the individual mm-hmm. who practices it, right? Mm-hmm. The question is, we as society have created a monstrous system is dysfunctional to the point where it's twice as expensive as it is in Italy or or anywhere else, actually. And yet, at the same time, we get the worst statistics. So mm-hmm. we have two, 2.6 physicians per 1,000 people here in the U.S. My friends in Italy have four, uh, Spain, four physicians. So you can tell that we are misallocated, misallocating the resources and the, the, the poor kids who have to pay tuition for college and tuition for medical school and then stay in residence are at, you know, for 11 years. I mean, it's really a huge investment. We have to find a solution, and it's not going to be just sweet-talking people into uh, going into a profession that has, gotcha. you know, be, becoming dysfun- become dysfunctional to the point where it needs a deep reform, but I don't think the politicians can do that. Uh, seven, seven five seven four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. Those are the numbers to call to join the conversation that we're having right now on the radio. Seven five seven four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero. What questions do you have for our panel of uh, medical experts that we have here today talking about the doctor shortage? One of, yeah, one of the things that uh, I think we need to bring up is the we talk about allocation of physicians. Um, urban setting versus rural setting, of course there's a difference. You're gonna have much less number of physicians per capita in a mm-hmm. uh, rural setting. So then you look at, and then you come into um, African-American communities, how many doctor's offices are actually located in the community, in the community and you'll find very few. Um, when I was growing up, you know, my father was a uh, considered a very prominent physician at the time. He died really young, but he was in the, I mean, the doctor's offices were in the neighborhoods, you know, but that has dissipated now. Mm-hmm. And there's several reasons why, but the bottom line is you talk about who needs the most allocated resources are the individuals in communities that are disadvantaged because of health challenges. Social determinants of health as they play a factor. You have food insecurity, housing insecurity. That's going to lead to poor diet, poor uh, exercise. You know, a lot of don't have green spaces or anywhere to go. Hence, how, you know, a higher incidence of health challenges. And then those individuals, and, and I'll give you a prime example. Yesterday, I had an employee wanted to see me as a as a patient and she came to me after she said doc it cost me eighty dollars to see you because <laughs> you know, her copay for specialists was eighty dollars and that's when you think about somebody who's working if they're a medical assistant they're already kind of at a shortfall of their income so then you ask that they have hypertension or some other medical challenge then they have to deal with that part so when you think about your copay then any medicines you need the cost of that your follow-up care, you know, changing whatever you need, as an example, any testing you need done, that stuff adds up. So the mm-hmm. patients are suffering as a result of that because they're like, and then they pick and choose, like certain medicines they say, I'm not going to take, I'm going to cut my pills in half, <laughs> try to, you know, <laughs> like that's really, yeah, 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 like really going to help anything. Mm-hmm. So you run to that issue as well. Can, so, I, can I make one comment? Sure, to, absolutely. To, to uh, mm-hmm. follow up on Keith's, uh, comment on access. That's Bruce Holbrook speaking. Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> if you look at Hampton Roads and you look at the hospitals that closed the past, over the past 20, 30, 40 years, where are they all located? Let me go down the list. Norfolk Community Hospital. Yep. Check. Knock them off the box. Yep. Yeah. DePaul Hospital. Check. Knock it off the box. Uh, Portsmouth General Hospital. Knock them off the box. Bayside Hospital. Knock them off the box. Yeah, box. New, these, Newport News General Hospital. Yeah. Well, they, right. the, right. No, but these are all in the lower income yeah. neighborhood mm-hmm. serving, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. primarily the uh, black population. And boom, they're. Yeah. yeah. Or, or try to find women's health care in the city of Portsmouth. I mean, there, there's, there's right, Portsmouth Naval. That's a great facility. Mm-hmm. But a private group doing women's care, I, mm-hmm. I can't find one. Yeah. 
Yeah, because the hospital there stopped doing the, yeah. their maternity ward. They closed. Mm-hmm. We yeah. talked about that yeah. on the show one day. Our phone lines are lit up. So yeah. let's go to the phones. Stephanie joins us from Suffolk. Hi, Stephanie. You're on the air. Hi. Hi. Um, I don't know. This Maybe I'm really old, but it seems like I remember when I was a kid in Suffolk that there were like the hospitals or the city subsidized doctors to come to your location and or like the health department you could have for low income people could actually go and see a doctor. It wasn't like the health department of today. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like we need to give incentives for students to go to med school that we're not we're not doing as as um, a state or I mean, maybe I'm getting into socialization, but we're not doing something right. We're oh. just not doing something right. Stephanie, thanks so much for the call. We we wanted to, she's moving us towards solutions. Sure, sure. Go uh, ahead. Sure, on, Steph. So a couple of things. Well, one is the. Um, the idea of service scholarships, mm-hmm. that, that if you practice in an underserved area, you could get a scholarship for medical school. Um, EVMS doesn't have the endowment yet for that, but Bruce and I think that that ought to be one of the primary things. So if you have a student who's from this area, who's likely to stay here, and who will be obligated to stay for, like the Navy, you do for four years of medical school, eight years of Navy, same thing. If you stay in this area, put down roots, buy a house, get a family. That that would help that. And then, as she said, the public health su- services are not being supported like they should. And we're not and funding those people absolutely. like they should. Let's talk to Debbie from Chesapeake. Hi, Debbie. You're on the air. Hi. Yeah, I have a daughter who just started medical school last month. And just want to give you the family and student idea. It's, first of all, it's very, very costly. I figure it costs her about $10,000 between testing and prep courses and all the fees and everything that that's just to, to get into the school the applications okay just uh-huh. to get into the school and the acceptance rate is two percent or less at a lot of these schools so these people who are applying these are the cream of the crop i'll tell you and even if it's an 80 20 or a 40 60 split or something it's way more than two percent that we need to be having get into medical school and be doctors, especially with the shortage we have. Mm -hmm. And they're willing to pay the cost. And you talk about the cost of school, you also have to look at opportunity costs. I figure it's easily a million dollars between the cost of medical school and what she's losing because she can't work for 10, 11 years. You mean outside Uh, of... uh, That's an accounting question. I agree wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly with you. And one that... One of the other aspects that needs to be, uh, the country needs to look at the universities is how can we shorten the period of time to become a doctor? You know, can we get the doctors through uh, undergraduate in three years and then three years in, in, in uh, medical school so you have a six-year program like Germany has right now? And that would, number one, an easy amount of debt that you come out with at the end. And then number two, it would, I mean, we're in a crisis situation right now that would start to promote to have more physicians out there in a you know mm-hmm. six year period of time rather than eight year period of time. Doctor Zahoni, I'm curious. I'd like to hear your perspective on on changing the length of time that doctors need to learn their profession. Actually, it's being done. Uh, you know, if you look at Duke, Duke has changed his curriculum to have mm-hmm. three years of training and then one year, which is research, right now because the rules have to be changed at the national level. For qualification as an MD, you know, and so this idea of going to three years is actually floating around. People are talking about it. Yeah, you know, you may have to have more intense uh, courses. The same is true for college. Uh, you know, there is a lot of um, uh, dead space in, in in the four years of college, and people are saying, well, why do we impose that? It would be a way of reducing actually tuition costs is to do it in three years. Like mm-hmm. in Germany, they do six years plus one year of internship and then the residency after that. So it's doable. Uh, the The problem is there's no mechanism really to sort of change the system in all of its inputs and outputs, if I may say so, because it's not just one thing that will fix it. You really have to have a comprehensive systemic change to be able to retain actually the lady who just said about her daughter, I mean, it's true. We're getting the cream of the crop in the U.S. The best doctors in the world are here. 
but we're misusing them, and we're not getting letting enough of them come through. That's the problem. Mm. If you're just joining us, we're talking about the doctor shortage in our country and the impact on Hampton Roads with retired neurologist Dr. Armstead Williams, CPA and president of Bruce Holbrook Consulting, Mr. Bruce Holbrook, renowned radiologist, biomedical engineer, and former director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Elias Zerhoni, and cardiologist and Another View co-host on health, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. We'll get back to our conversation in just a moment. It. But first, we want to check in with Lisa for an update on how many of you have decided to become a member of WHRV FM and the Another View family with your pledge of support. How are we doing, Lisa? Well, Barbara, we're doing very well. We are uh, halfway toward, a little over halfway toward our goal. We've okay. raised um, $1,250 thus okay. far. All Thank right. you all for minutes. those yeah. who have called in. So keep those calls coming. We love them. Absolutely. Now, the call for to make your pledge of support, Barry. What is that number? 800-940-7170. They also can go online to whrv.org. And if you have the super cool WHRO app, all you need to do is hit that little red donate button. It's right there on the app and it takes you just a few seconds of your time. And I I think all the time, Barbara, we do cool things here at Public Radio. You know, we we produce cool things like this program and we have a really cool app also. (laughs) And you know what else is really cool? We got our guests here at the table are all members of WHRO. So there you go. We love that. (laughs) We love that. We love when that happens. So 1-800-940-7170. We have a $2,000 match, right, Lisa? So we have about 30 minutes left to... um, for you to double your money if you call in right now and make your pledge of support at 1-800-940-7170. I had to think about it for a minute because I didn't want to tell the other number. (laughs) (laughs) People ask me, do you say those numbers in your sleep? And I say, yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we always have that producer uh, um, dream, right? Where you're just repeating the number over and over Over and over over again. again. So at least I'm going to give you the last few minutes. Our phones are so lit up. I'm going to get back to our conversation, but convince people please to call in think about this program and what you get from another view each and every week we love bringing it to you but and from from what we hear from the community you love being able to tune in and listen to the conversations that are happening on another view so take this as an opportunity to support what you love this is your time to become a part of our family this is there's a difference and barry you can you can tune in on this there is an ownership that that comes with becoming a member you feel like oh yeah I support you, that program. That's my program. You listen differently. You really do. You, you really do. absolutely do. So whro.org or 1-800-940-7170. And I'm going to take us back to our conversation. So gentlemen, you know, and I'm listening to you all talking about this too. It's it, Doctors are supposed to be like the, the top of the pyramid, but it sounds like it's all these other things that are making, that are moving health care. Um, yeah. Where well, maybe you guys aren't at the top of the pyramid. Yeah, well, we've never been at the top of the pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, well, that's the way I mean, to put, I, the, I, the I, community perceives you. <laughs> that way, but no, we, the yeah. insurance companies rule the world. I mean, unfortunately, so and they dictate policy. And it's and the, one of the biggest frustrating things for me that, and I'm sure uh, Dr. Williams can attest to, uh, is when you're in practice, you think about um, how many you got to fight to get, you know. Even to get a uh, like a medication, I'm sure you know some of that as well, Barbara. You know, the process that you have to go through, the amount of paperwork you have to go through, that stuff can be unruly. And it takes away your ability to care for patients. And, you know, sometimes patients, they get mad at me and say, you didn't call me back five minutes after I called you. I was like, well, I hear you. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> you want to come do all this paperwork for me? I well, mean, that's the reality of what we have. So we're really not... I mean, I don't. Th- I mean, we have a lot of challenges. I think of fortunes so we've had to deal with over the years, and and most of us are stay in this because we love it. I mean, I would. I couldn't see myself doing anything else other than what I do. It was definitely my commitment uh, to to my life. But I, I want to ask Dr. Williams a question. So when you retired. And you sent out that letter because I've gotten mm-hmm. letters from doctors too that have retired to retire. But but what was the impact on your patients? I mean, real talk. <laughs> it's it's tough because you I've took care of some of these people for forty years, uh, and uh, 
for both of them, for me and for them, to this trust relationship that you build up, and that takes some time and takes some eye to eye time. And Keith, the, the aggravations of of all the the bureaucratic stuff, but being in a room with somebody and and being able to say, "Tell me how you're doing." Yeah. And having the real conversation and saying, "Let's, what are we going to do about this? How do we, this is what I see happening? What are we going to do to make this better?" What, what, you know, mm-hmm. that, there's nothing that's like that, yeah. and and they're learning things every day. But the impact on patients is tough. It's like losing an old friend. And, Were you able to send them to someone else, or did they have to yes, go out on I, their I, own? I, I, I arranged to, to have them see one. I would pick one of my partners. I think they would oh, work okay. well with this person. Okay. And, but okay. the tough part is still, you even think about I think about when a pastor retires from a church and a new yeah. pastor comes in. That pastor may be good that's coming in, but you're still used to that. Yeah. You had. Yeah. And yeah. the toughest thing is letting that relationship go because that, that part of that trust part is so hard. Well, you know, you'll find that for I think most of us that were old school in our ways of thinking is it was it's not difficult to create a trust issue, but you hate to lose it when you have to step away because we, again we're, we're none of us are getting any younger. But mm-hmm. you will find that what I have found some of the younger docs have a little bit more difficulty with that bridge building because the, this is the way the structure is set up now. The structure mm-hmm. is different, you know, versus before. Uh, you see somebody and, you know, it's like you, know, you get into a group, you know, you may see a different doctor in the hospital every day, you know, who, depending on who's rounding in that practice for that day. I've always prided myself to go and round on everybody every day myself. And I do that because, again, that relationship you build, it does help you in terms of how you deliver care. And, and you know, you think about it, somebody's going to give you a medicine. Do you want to take that message if you don't trust the guy that's giving it to you? Right. I mean, you know, exactly. you're, you're going to have some hesitation. Then that delays care even more. So I think as we're going along, one of the things that I hope happens is the ability to get more people in. But more importantly, I want to try to emphasize to the younger people to learn how to communicate effectively. And everybody's on the cell phone now. Yeah, you know, I've been in a car. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but I've been in a car where you transport and kids places and they're back in the back seat texting each other when they right, sit right they next sit to each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, and so to me, and then when you see that, that means there's a, a loss in yeah. the ability to how you interact with other people to know how to build that trust factor. So that's mm-hmm. the thing that I try to emphasize to the younger docs that I work with. I say, you know, that piece you have to have. I mean, you you cannot. You could try to survive without it, but it's not going to help you in terms of your yeah. quest of delivering the kind of care you want to deliver. And, and, go ahead. and we've been through a rough patch with the electronic medical record, where you go see a doctor and you feel like they're just sitting there typing the whole time. That's Keith was telling me. I think his program is is that's going to change some, so you'll have more eyeball time. Yeah. Because if yeah. you're not watching somebody, you're not seeing when their eyes are glazing over. You're not seeing. Okay, we're we're on to it right now. Right. Right, this exactly. I need to follow up on this question. And I will say AI. That's that's the only time I think I've ever been interested in an AI situation in medicine is uh, that because the, the AI technology is now where you can put your phone in the middle of the conversation and you just talk to the patient and it actually takes and it, ca- takes and it captures the it, it takes out the stuff that's not relevant puts in the stuff that is and creates your note because I'm gonna t- I spend four hours a night on notes wow four hours every day. I'm seeing 30 to 35 people a day. You see them, you got to get your note done at the end of the day. And I'm there from usually from somewhere between 5 to 9 or 10 o'clock just doing notes. Let me ask you a question, Bruce. Um, When the doctor has arrived, okay, they've gone through medical school, they've done their residency, they're getting set up. You know, what is there a, a class on how to manage the debt? <laughs> is no, there, because, or, or, or did they say, call you or what? Well, I mean, they, what no, happens? Well, a lot of times they come in. I mean, I've been out of doing returns for a few years, but a lot of times mm-hmm. they come in and they got out of medical school and they have this $200,000 debt, but they want to buy, you know, now they're making good money, so they qualify, they buy a big house that they can't afford. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they they marry an expensive you know, relationship, and you got that, and they have a couple kids. And, no, it's it's tough to educate them and just say, look, you don't have to have everything right now. And, yeah. But they've been deprived of that for a number of years, and you know they looked at this thing, and then then the hospital comes around and says you're overpaid, and yeah, it just it's it's not really good. One of the things. Yeah. Go ahead, Elliot. Were you going to say something, Elliot? No, no, just, just something I would like to point out is sure. many of these young doctors I've known, I've advised, 
actually go to the financing world. They go to Wall Street. They go to uh, work in pharmaceutical companies. Mm. And where the pay is more uh, higher, more stable, predictable type of work. So there is also a huge loss factor. We lose a lot of Mm. doctors to non-medical professions or non-direct patient care, if you will. Wow, I hadn't even thought about like, that. That's right. very interesting. Yeah, we're going for insurance administration. Yeah. Yeah. Some will work for insurance companies. Yeah. Some will work for pharmaceuticals. All right, let's see if we can get some calls in because these phone lines are lit up. Pam joins us from Yorktown. Hi, Pam. You're on the air. Hi. I've unfortunately had to experience several times in an emergency room uh, since June. And uh, things like with an upper GI bleed, and there's no specialist in the uh, emergency room, very few specialists in the emergency room anymore. And they refer you out to a doctor. And when you try to get the appointment, they tell you they're not available or it'll be three months. It's a little like you're either dead or you're healed by that point. I needed a neurologist. And I was told there were no, and this is in VCU of all places, no neurology appointments available. And that was in July. And I got a phone call a couple of weeks ago saying, we got an appointment for you in May. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's oh, cool. my so goodness. You're dealing with... And I lost my primary care, and all five physicians in that uh, uh, practice weren't accepting new patients. So then you have to go looking. Uh, yeah. Try and find a primary care today. I found one, but my appointment's not till next month, and I've been looking since May. Mm. Um, can I? Okay, Pam, I'm going to let the, let the panel respond to you. Thank you so much for the call. Can, ahead, can, Bruce. I, can I respond? If, if, I, if, I, if I, sure. just let me say something quickly, sure. Ruth, sorry. Yeah. Just to to empathize with uh, the lady who called, mm-hmm. my doctor retired at Johns Hopkins, okay? Mm-hmm. He took his retirement, and he said, you know, I don't have anybody available, but you're so connected. You're the you know, former NIH director. You were the executive vice dean. I'm sure you'll have no problem. It took me three months to wow. find a doctor. And then when I found that, it took me another three months to get my first appointment. So, so it's not. Oh, so there's not lady. even a doctor courtesy <laughs> thing going on. <laughs> That's right. And so this lady is telling you something that is very true across the country. Wow. Oh my goodness. Go ahead, Bruce. Oh, just to, to make a little comment is just kind of laughter, but. You know, when I was doing accounting, I never had a problem getting a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, it's a huge problem. I, I just got to bring up and and also ask Dr. Zahuni, you know, what needs to be done on a national and state level because we have a huge crisis. And we, you know, the, even if Dr. Williams, myself, and Dr. Zahuni were going to try to solve it right now, we can't. There's not enough doctors out there. And the question is, Elias, maybe you can address it. What needs to be done on a national basis to start to reform this? Yeah, I mean, nobody has figured it out, but I have my own ideas. Uh, okay. You know, when I came, when I started um, in this um, profession, I thought our system was the best in the world. I no longer think that. And, but I'm not blaming anybody, because if you really think about our system, and you say, you know, as Dr. Newby was describing, the insurance companies, they come in and they, they give you all this trouble and the paperwork. But if you ask them and you talk to them, you see that they're rational. They're making the right decision by trying to reduce the cost of health care, which is what they need to do for their customers, the employers. Then you talk to a health care system. Well, they get out of poor communities because they will lose money in poor communities. It's a completely rational from the accounting point of view, Bruce, uh, but it's a rational decision. And the same thing is true in regulation. I mean, you're making decisions, for example, where you limit the, the provision of services to a certain class of people. You're giving a monopoly and so that you can't use care extenders and nurses to provide more services. That's a rational decision. The, the, the thing that I tell people is that, you know, what I learned when I was for seven years working in Washington is that a sum of rational decisions made by stakeholders – is not necessarily rational. And that's where we are. Mm. I think Mm. the system we have is becoming rational, even though each actor is really acting rationally. Like, for example, the medical school, you know, the health systems are benefiting from these doctors, right? They have become huge, and they have Mm. become monopolistic in certain regions. And the same is true for insurance companies. Yet, they, they contribute nothing to the creation of their own human resource, which is the doctors, that they're going to run, they're going to run their practice 
over time. That's why many, many doctors now are becoming employed by these health systems. The mm-hmm. government pays for a residency, but does not really help on, on the medical school side. So to, 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 to summarize what I think is, needs to be done are four things. Number one, our system is too politicized. And I've seen it. I mean, when Obamacare went through, there was a huge partisan fight, and it passed by one vote. Mm-hmm. I was there when uh, the former President Bush tried to get the drug prescription coverage for seniors. People were going hungry to get their medication. Who would be against that, right? Yet it only passed by one vote with a tremendous partisan battle. Right. Mm. So I don't believe that if you're going to give more benefit like Obamacare or prescription and you end up with these political battles, that means your system is gridlocked. There are so Mm -hmm. many vested interests, which are rational, as I said, Mm -hmm. which are going to prevent that. So you need to depoliticize the system. The second thing is, you know, if you go around this country, the care in Mississippi or the, or the diseases in, in certain states are very different than other states. Yet we have a centralized system that has a one-size-fits-all. We need to regionalize health care. We need to have a little bit like the Federal Reserve. You know, the Federal Reserve is independent from Congress in setting monetary policies, and we need to have something that is equivalent, maybe 12 health care regions that really adapt to their own needs. Mm. and their own epidemiology. We don't have that. We have 200 folks in Washington that are doing one-size-fits-all regulation for everybody. And if you do not follow regulation, oh, there's fraud and abuse. So it freezes the system. So just give you an example, right? We spend about $4 trillion uh, in healthcare every day, every every year, about 20% of our GDP. Do you know how much of that is spent on just administrative transactions? Almost a trillion, mm. almost a trillion dollar. Now you look at healthcare systems. They've, in Pittsburgh, for example, there's only one healthcare system, 45 hospitals. The CEO of this nonprofit organization makes more money than the CEO of a for-profit corporation, and yet they have reduced the uh, what we would call you know charitable care in the old days mm. um, uh, as a proportion of what they do, and they have a huge endowment. I'm sure it's the same in, in, in Norfolk, with Santara. All of these systems have to behave that way. They can't afford to basically provide for the, the gaps in the system, which are really created by, like I said, a sum of rational decisions, which has led to an irrational outcome. If you don't do the three things that I'm talking about, you depoliticize, you regionalize, you remove intermediaries, who are taking a lot of money out of the system, I just told you, $1 trillion, Mm -hmm. which is really to intermediaries that have nothing to do and to provide nothing, like uh, pharmacy benefit managers I know about, you know, where Mm -hmm. they really push, actually, the prices up so they can have a bigger commission. And at the end of the day, it's innovation as well. So that's my Mm -hmm. fourth pillar, if you will. Why is innovation not done? Why is is Keith, why is uh, Armstead, why am I forced to practice a certain way and I cannot innovate, right? Mm. I'll give you one example. When I was at, at Johns Hopkins, I was head of radiology, and I developed a very, very fast scanner. I could scan someone in less than 45 seconds, okay? So you could mm. come in in radiology, you can have your, your total body scan, and then you can go to the floor, and then within minutes we would know what's wrong. And I asked, I said, why don't we do this instead of doing a scan of the head, a scan of the chest, a scan of the... You know what the lawyer, you know what the lawyer told me? He said, doctor, you will go to jail if you do that. I said, what do you mean I will go to jail? Because it goes against Medicare rules, which force you to have a prescription for every single portion of your body. We got to slice the body, and it's still today the case. So innovation was, was basically stifled. If we had independent regions that had a basic health care package for everybody, and then private health care on top, and that they adapt with patients uh, you know, at the table, like, like you have in the Federal Reserve. You have business people at the table, and it applies to them. And then I think that would be the solution, but I am a little bit of a 
naive uh, person when it comes to that because I've seen. <laughs> no, you, no, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're, no. you're absolutely on point. Go ahead, it's keeping with uh, uh, This is really. <laughs> It falls into, uh, in my in my public health degree I'm working on still, <laughs> it falls into what they call a wicked problem. And this is what it is. You have all these inputs coming in and, you know, different outputs that come out. You have the, you know, the political aspect, you know, the financial aspect, uh, you know, social aspects. And they all come into this uh, kind of issue of trying to figure out, okay, how do you resolve this problem? And you have so many people in the mix. And that's the one thing I wish they... Uh, you know, uh, that we could do is to cut out that uh, you get somebody in, in Congress or in the government that's making decisions about medical issues. They don't know anything about medicine. So how are you going to make a medical decision when you have no clue? That's why decisions, I think, are made wrong. You know? yeah. and, and unfortunately, so how do you change that? You know? Let me see if we can get a couple more calls in before we're almost out of time. Eric joins us from Newport News. Hi, Eric. You're on the air. Hey, uh Thanks for taking my call. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Um, as a, a, somebody that's going to be uh, retiring as a physician, I'm finding out that I cannot continue to practice in a part-time basis or in a free clinic unless I pay a, a malpractice uh, tail insurance coverage, which is uh, substantial. And I think that may be something to look at about, uh, you know, in addressing the physician shortage. And the second comment I had is, how would anybody choose to go to medical school, take that education for the long time, acquire up to half a million dollars in debt, like you mentioned, rather than just taking the shorter, less financially uh, a burdening route of becoming a nurse practitioner? Okay. Thanks, Eric, for the call. I think Who a, wants to answer? Yeah, well, I think a lot of this just depends on your um, your interests um, and what you deem is important in your life. For me personally, I mean, I have no regrets. Zero. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I absolutely wouldn't do anything other than what I do currently, and I wouldn't be happy doing anything other than what I'm doing currently. The question that it's like my daughter's at Chapel Hill, and um, you know, she, and she's a biology major, but I've told her on several occasions, I said, listen, if what you choose to do, don't do it because of me. Yeah, do it because that's your passion. So if you have a passion in medicine, then I think you should go for it. Uh, if you don't, you know, then I wouldn't do it because the level of commitment that is required, you know, you have to love what you do. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing I would, would tell people. So I think is it really just depends on you, on you as an individual. But financially, you do have to take into account how much you're going to have to pay in the end because you think about interest rates, you know, depending on where they are and, you know, the loan that you have. Uh, that's a challenge. And I really think the focus really should be how do we reduce the cost of, of medical school? I mean, to me, to get you there, that's what really need to focus. Needs what to about be. his point of, um, and Bruce, maybe you may be able to answer this, about the insurance that he has to have if he wants to practice at a free clinic or, I, I, or whatever. Are you familiar? I'm not totally familiar with it, but I, don't, okay. I think with the free clinic, that doesn't sound the, the, yeah, you, you get, right. They, they don't cover your insurance at a free clinic, yeah. but but it's true that if you say, you know, I, I'm, I can't work this pace, but I'd like to work three days a week because I'm now 65, 67 years old, mm -hmm. that ought to be doable. It ought to be doable without, without malpractice taking so much of what you, what you make. Well, we have such a litigious society mm -hmm. that unfortunately, yeah. so they have to have that. You know, I mean, that's the downside and this stuff and tail and my practice tails, depending on how long you've been in practice, that's how much it costs. My, you know, when I, when I, when I went over to Bon Secours, my malpractice tail was almost 50 grand because I've wow. been in practice for 20 yeah. plus years. So, you know, yeah. and I'd never been sued before, but it didn't matter. You know, the fact is when you practice that long, they know somebody could come out from 20 years ago, you know, and say you did something to them that they had a problem with. So let me ask you this question, too, because I hear a lot of patients say this. Um, when we're talking about uh, nurse practitioners and mm -hmm. with um, physician assistants and they go, why is my insurance paying that same amount? And I never get to see the doctor. Well, you're seeing a provider. I guess in the issue that has become is that you may not see anybody. You know, I, mean, I mean, so I mean, that's, the a, thing, very, that's so, a good point. So I, I understand. Point. I understand their point, but it's not to say because everybody, most nurse practitioners or physician assistants are under a doctor, so they're not making always unilateral decisions. Good. Please explain that because okay. I think that's that's what people think is that here you've got this person that may not have had as much education, yeah. the length of time, et cetera, um, but yet they're 
treating me and i don't know if that's yeah. so majority of them that there are some i think nurse practitioners that can be independent now that but that's okay. just recently the case but the vast majority are going to be under some provider a, a physician physician and that person has to guide and you know look, re- review their notes sign off on them and sometimes you know, even i have a physician assistant that works with me I oftentimes will see those patients, even though the nurse, I mean, the uh, PA is seeing them, mm-hmm. you still go and see them anyway, because you need to know what's going on. I like talking to the patients anyway. That gives me a, a chance to really see what's going on. I don't knock, uh, uh, I think they have the care, clear capability. The only thing they don't have, what we have is the level of training we had. Cause you oh, know, okay. think about, I did four years of college, four years of medical school, three years of residency, four years of fellowship to do what I do. What's the difference between a residency and a fellowship? Residency is this when you're, that's like when you come out of your, whatever your branch specialty is, internal right. medicine or surgery or OB or psychiatry, whatever you have that that's your training to get to that level. But when mm-hmm. you go into a fellowship, that means you go into a subspecialty. You go into a deeper oh, okay. That's area. where you became the yeah, cardiologist. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Gotcha. So that's what that, that, that part is. If, I, if, if I may, yes. I'd like to address the uh, nursing question. Okay, we got two course. minutes First left, of, so go quick. Go yeah, ahead. <laughs> very, very quickly, uh-huh. there's a bigger, a bigger shortage of nurses than there is of doctors. Yeah. That's number one. Wow. Number two, it's true what, what the gentleman was saying. A lot of students that I talk to say, you know what, maybe I'll just become a nurse because it turns out that there's so much shortage that the salaries, especially these nurses that, that, that go around oh, yeah. different exactly. hospitals, you know, uh, they prefer that because A, it's a controlled uh, schedule. It's a better lifestyle. They can also uh, have a family. Uh, and so I think that trend is happening as we speak. People say, you know what, the responsibility of a doctor is too much for me. And I'd rather be a nurse, especially that there is a huge shortage yeah. of nursing. Dr. Zahoni, I'm, you're going to have to have the last word because we are out of time. Obviously, this is a subject that people are very interested in, and we'll have to have you all come back again and join us. Thank you. That was Dr. Elias Zahoni. Um, we also had Dr. Armstead Williams and Mr. Bruce Holbrook and Keith Newby, my favorite cardiologist can on I, the planet. Can I say something <laughs> yes, real quick? Very quick. quick. Uh-huh. Uh, real quick, Dr. Zerhuni is working on a book that's coming out in March. Thank Call you. it Disease Knows No Politics. So, uh, Oh, great. It's can, coming can, out this coming March? This coming March. Okay. Uh, they, All right. uh, they, a lot of these issues are addressed. And that. that'll be a perfect time to have him come back. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Lisa, I understand that we have met our goal. Is that correct? Yes, we have. Yes. <laughs> We raised three thousand one hundred and ninety-five dollars yeah, during the that's hour, awesome. and that you awesome. add the match money. So during the hour, we raised five thousand one hundred and ninety-five dollars. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. So everyone who has joined us, for those of you who upped your your sustainer amount, for those of you who joined us the first time, those of you who came back because you disappeared for a little while, we really appreciate all of it. And those of you who are on the phones right now, still holding on, we really appreciate you calling in. Sorry that we did not have a chance to get to you, but we're here every Thursday at noon bringing you insightful and engaging conversations about the issues of the day. So if you like what you hear, you still have time because it's not quite one o'clock yet to become a member of WHRO Public Media. Join us at 1-800-940-7170 and join the the Another View family. Next week on Another View, the conundrum of covering politics when race is involved and you are a black journalist. Don't miss this conversation. Our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Jordan Christie is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. Early voting has started. Have you voted yet? Time to get busy. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Join us again next Thursday at noon for Another View. Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students, 
Learn more at leaveabequest.org.